So last week in our study in Acts, we skipped a couple of chapters going from chapter 5 all the way over to chapter 8. And this week we're going to do kind of something a little similar. Today we're going to skip chapter 9 and we're going to go to chapter 10. Again, this is not because what's in chapter 9 isn't important. Rather, why we're doing it this week is because I actually want to finish out the, uh, the ministry of Philip and the ministry of Peter, which is really kind of linked and, and combined in many ways, which you'll kind of see a little bit today. But then next week, or actually, actually after we finish talking about Peter and Cornelius in chapter 10, we're going to go back to chapter 9 and start looking at the ministry of Paul. And then we'll close out our study in Acts by looking at the ministry of Paul and covering all the way through there. So don't be, uh, don't be alarmed. Don't be wondering, okay, what's going on here? This is a big story, this conversion of Paul that happens in chapter 9. We will come back. We will cover it. Before we get started, let's go ahead and pray once again, this time to ask God to bless our study in his word this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds, that we would hear you, that we would be transformed and affected by your word this morning, Lord. Lord, use your word this morning, use this study this morning to change us, to bring transformation to us first, that we may go out and use it to transform others around us, those who you bring into our life, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, we, we looked at the story of Philip and the Ethiopian. It's really this great story, and it's kind of, in many ways, this unexpected story. Philip, who was, after, after the church was persecuted, Philip took off. He went to Samaria, had a thriving ministry in Samaria, and then he ended up going to, by the Spirit. The Spirit sent him to this deserted road out in the middle of Gaza, out in the middle of the desert on this road that never gets used anymore, that's abandoned. And there he runs into, kind of coincidentally, we might think, he runs into this Ethiopian eunuch. And he has this great conversation with this eunuch. This eunuch is, he hears this eunuch reading from the book of Isaiah. And he's reading about just who exactly this Isaiah's description of the Messiah and who the Messiah is and what's going to happen to the Messiah. And we looked at how this kind of compares to the suffering of the Messiah, how it compares to in many ways the suffering that the Ethiopian likely just came out of and experienced in Jerusalem himself. And, and, and Philip takes this, takes all these seemingly opportune, perfect moments, perfect timing, and he takes advantage of this, and he shares the gospel with the eunuch. He shares the gospel with the Ethiopian. He leads the Ethiopian to this point of saying that it's not just God, it's not just going to the temple, it's also Jesus. It's his faith in Jesus as his Savior. It's Jesus as the one who's going to take this Gentile eunuch, somebody who's completely rejected and cursed by God, take him and bring even somebody like him into the community, into the body of believers. It's this great story of God pursuing the unpursuable among us. And so we have this story, and after, after uh, the eunuch accepts Jesus, and they go down to this, to this pond, this lake, whatever it was, this body of water, the eunuch is baptized, and we're told that immediately the Spirit takes Philip, and just like that, it's like Philip is transported to Azotus, and we don't understand how that happened or what that's all about, but it's just the Spirit took him to another town, to the town by the name of Azotus, it was just on, it was a coastal town. And Philip started then there at Azotus and worked his way up the coast, preaching the gospel in every little village, every town, every person he passed, preached the gospel all the way up to Caesarea. It's in Caesarea that we are actually going to begin our text this morning. We're going to, like I said, we're going to Acts chapter 10 is where we're going. And um, let's go ahead and read a couple of verses before we get too far. I wasn't going to get ahead of myself. Acts chapter 10. This is where we're going this morning. You'll find us on page 1,708 in the Bibles and the pews in front of you. And I invite you to go ahead and leave your Bible open because we're going to break this up into two parts. Just kind of help keep things clear. Acts chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the tanner whose house is by the sea. 
When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who, who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. I'm going to go ahead and stop there for a second as we kind of deal with this. So we, we left Philip going to Caesarea, and that is for, for the story of Philip and the ministry of Philip. In many ways, that's where Philip's ministry ends, at least as it's recorded in Scripture. We have a little, a little, um, a little uh, mention of him later on in the book of Acts that talks about Philip and the daughters that he had. But beside that, beyond that, this is where Philip's recorded ministry comes to an end. But it's in Caesarea where our story picks up. And Caesarea is really kind of this interesting thing that we really need to spend some time thinking about or looking at what exactly or, or what exactly is the deal with Caesarea. You see, in Caesarea, Caesarea, when we think about the larger global ministry of the church, the Great Commission, this, this commission from Jesus to go out and spread the gospel to the world outside of Jerusalem, Caesarea is the place you want to go. Caesarea was, in many ways, it was the sort of the Roman equivalent politically and commercially to Jerusalem in the region of Palestine. Caesarea began, it began and it was originally established as a, as a small Jewish fishing village on the Mediterranean Sea. And over time, as we start to get to the point of about King Herod, just before the birth of Jesus, King Herod really wanted to do something to try and stay on Rome's good side. And so King Herod, or Herod the Great, started pumping tremendous amounts of money and energy and personnel into this small fishing village. And he started building, he expanded the harbor and made it so that you could actually bring cargo ships into Caesarea. And he began building these enormous public buildings for the public to enjoy things like amphitheaters and, and other things like that. And, and as Rome started to move in and conquer this area, Rome moved in and they took over this town. They took over this town and they made it their own. Herod the Great renamed it in favor or in honor of Caesar Augustus and gave it its name Caesarea. And so Rome came in and they set up shop and they said, this is where we're going to base ourselves in this region of Palestine. This is where all our political stuff, all of our commercial stuff, everything's going to be run out of Caesarea here. It's easy to get to. It's centrally located. It works for us. And so what happened is that this small Jewish, this small Israeli fishing village became this sprawling Roman city. That is where we are. What's kind of awkward about that, or kind of strange about that, is that even though the eunuch from last week was a Gentile, and we saw his conversion, the fact that Philip ended up in Caesarea, kind of, kind of starts to say, you know what, the, the gospel, the church is spreading, the church is growing, and it's changing. Up to this point, the church was largely based still within the city limits of Jerusalem, which means it was still also, it was still Jewish. They still thought of themselves as Jews. And even though the Ethiopian was a Gentile, in many ways, because that conversion, that co conversation took place out in the desert, out miles away from anything, and the Ethiopian took off and went back to Africa, nobody was going to learn about it. Nobody was going to have any interaction with this Ethiopian. But in Caesarea, if the church spreads in Caesarea, if Philip sets up shop in Caesarea, they have to start really thinking about just how Jewish are we. Are we still going to be a Jew, the real, the true Jews? Or do things need to change? Being in Caesarea is a game changer for the early church. And in Caesarea, there's this man by the name of Cornelius, a centurion. And Luke says this about, about, about Cornelius. He says in verse 2, he says, He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. So Cornelius is described as a god fear, which really in, in, in biblical and Jewish, in a Jewish thinking, in a Jewish way of thinking, a god fear was not necessarily Jewish. He was still a Gentile. He wasn't Jewish because he probably wasn't circumcised. Usually the term that the label god fear is, is, is put on somebody who has not been circumcised, has not been fully converted, but does acknowledge belief in the God of Israel. And so here's Cornelius, and he's described as a god fear, but it's not just a god fear. He's somebody who, said, who Luke says gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. Those are actually two out of the three pillars in Jewish piety. The third one that's not mentioned is fasting. What Luke is saying here is that this Cornelius guy, even though, he's a, even though he's a Gentile, there is no doubt whatsoever in his faith. So you have a Roman officer living in a Roman Gentile city 
who has rejected his Roman and Greek gods that he grew up with in favor of worshiping the God of Israel. You know, Romans had a word for somebody like that who rejected the Roman gods. It was atheist. I know it sounds kind of funny to us. But Romans called people who rejected the Roman and the Greek gods, they called them atheists. And here's a man who's got, here's a man of standing. Here's a man who's got some respect, some pull, some influence in the community. And he has rejected the Roman and the Greek gods. And he has said, no, I am going to believe and I'm going to worship the God of Israel. So he's, so here's Cornelius, a devout God fearer. It says, one day at about three in the afternoon, it's about the time for the af- time for afternoon prayers in Judaism. Orthodox Jews, conservative Jews, they will spend, they have designated times of prayer throughout the day. This is one of those times of prayer, which just kind of emphasizes his faith. At about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. And Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? And the angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Essentially, Cornelius, God has recognized your faith. He sees that even though you're not circumcised, even though you're a Gentile, God has recognized your faith. He's recognized what you're doing. He's recognized that it is true. You're acceptable before God. God is okay with you. So your, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Send men to Joppa and, and bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner whose house is by the sea. No indication is given that Cornelius knows who this Peter guy is. You see, we know Peter. Peter's a popular guy. He's all throughout the Gospels. He's all throughout the book of Acts so far. He's doing these incredible things and has this incredible ministry going on in Jerusalem. But the fact that the angel has to go into so much detail for who exactly Peter is kind of suggests that you know, Cornelius didn't even know who this Peter was. Word had not yet reached. The gospel had not yet been spread. The church had not yet reached Caesarea, at least not on a large enough scale, so that it was recognized and Peter was unknown there. So go and find this Peter. And so Cornelius calls together some of his guys, some of his helpers, some of his men. He says, you know, go to Joppa. This is what happened. This is the vision I just had. Go to Joppa and find this Peter guy. You need to bring him back here. Verse 9. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open up and something like a large sheep being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. And the voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. So God has this great plan of spreading the gospel throughout the world. And to go and to do it, he wants to work it through the Roman Empire. So he brings it to Caesarea. And you would think ordinarily that what God's going to do is he's going to send one of his. He's going to send somebody who is already a part of this church to Caesarea to take care of this job. But instead of doing that, first he goes to Cornelius and gives Cornelius his vision. He says, go and hunt down this Peter guy. Now, this is kind of where some of the timing tends to work out. And we saw this with Philip and the Ethiopian too, how the timing so many times and so often when it comes to spreading the gospel works out in such a way that we just don't get it, but it's just so perfect. Everything just comes together at exactly the right time. And at this time, as these men are on their way, actually as these men are texted, as these men are approaching Joppa, it's at that time that Peter goes up on the roof to pray. So Peter goes up on the roof to pray, and it's getting to be about lunchtime. He gets hungry, he falls into a trance, and then he has this vision of this sheet filled with all these clean and unclean animals. And this voice, presumably the voice from God, says, take this, Peter, kill these animals and eat. You're hungry, eat. This is strange. I mean, honestly, I mean, we're used to hearing this story. We've heard this story a lot, but there's the reality of we're, kind of, if we're able to kind of step out of our history a little bit and think about everything we've heard about this story. We look at this, we think, this is weird. God, what in the world are you up to here? We don't get it. We don't understand what exactly the point is. We need to talk about this, this food thing for a second. 
Because what God does when he, hand, when he lowers down this food, and he lowers down this food, what he's doing is he's telling Peter to violate the laws that he himself, that God himself set. You know, I think we've probably all heard many times that Jews have these very strict laws, especially when it comes to eating, these kosher laws. There are certain things they can and cannot eat. And here God is saying, here's all this stuff that I've told you and been explicit about. Don't eat. Eat it. I'm giving you permission to eat it. You see, the basis for this goes all the way back to, in order to get to kind of at the root of this, the basis for this goes all the way back to the book of Leviticus. Really kind of the entire book of Leviticus. Leviticus is this, is this great book. It's kind of this boring book. If you've ever tried to read through the Bible in a year, usually what happens is you get to the book of Leviticus, Genesis and Exodus, everything's going great. You get to the book of Leviticus and it's kind of like, oh man. Do I really have to go through this again? Do I really have to read this? And you start reading, you get about halfway through, and it's just, you know, you don't do this, and you don't do that, and this thing's going to make you clean, and this thing's going to make you unclean, and it's all these laws, and if Leviticus doesn't do you, and Numbers is going to, and by that point you just say, forget it, I'm done. Yeah, it's kind of the natural, the nature of the book of Leviticus. We don't like it. We don't like thinking about it or reading it because it's boring. It reads like a legal document. Essentially, that is what Leviticus is. Essentially, it is a legal document. It's the legal definition. It's the legal standard on which God, that God gave to Moses, gave to the people of Israel through Moses during the Exodus. It's a legal document that says that this is what it means to be my people. This is how my people live. This is how my people look. This is what they eat. This is what they do. And it, and it contains these sometimes just crazy laws about, about you know, how to set up a tent. And, and not wearing poly blend clothes. I mean, who knew that God was in the fashion, right? Don't wear poly blend clothes. It talks about things like, you know, you can eat these things, you cannot eat these things. It talks about things about how often you're supposed to wash your hands. It talks about just, just all this just weird stuff that makes us think to ourselves, what in the world is going on? What's the point? Where first century Jews started, like Peter, started to go wrong as they started to look at these things and treat these things and all these little details as sort of like God being a micromanager. They started to look at this stuff almost like, you know, God really is concerned with these tiny little details. He really does have a problem with somebody who believes in him accidentally eating a pork chop at a Labor Day barbecue or something. I don't know. But they got mixed up in the way that they thought about this stuff to the point where if you don't wash your hands a certain way, if you don't set up your tent in a certain way facing a certain direction, it's not just that you're in danger of, you know, God, you know, doing something mean to you. You're actually, your salvation is in danger here. And even the most nominal, even the, most, the Jews who just were just kind of Jewish by name only, when it came to the kosher food laws, that was the one thing they were not going to mess up. And so here we have Peter, who's much more than just a nominal Jew, being commanded to eat something that's not clean. And you, under, and you think you see his response in verse 14 in our text. What does it say? It says, uh, I guess it would help us on the right page. Verse 14, surely not, Lord. It's this, expon it's this response of shock. Peter has been offended. He's thinking, God, you can't possibly be asking me to do this because it's just wrong. It's not that I don't want to do it. It's just wrong. Peter was missing the point of Leviticus. You see, God really wasn't that concerned with all these tiny little details. What God was concerned about, he was concerned about his people looking different. He was concerned about his people living different and actually being distinct from society. It's about protecting God's holiness and talking about how God's holiness comes down and is transferred to his people and his people are intended to reflect that. You and me are intended to reflect that holiness in every little detail of our life. We've been talking about it as the lordship of Jesus in our study in, in, in Acts. It's the same basic thing. God wants us to look and live different. And you look at Cornelius. Cornelius looked and lived different. And his life, in some ways, was on the line because of that difference. So Peter's commanded to eat. And he says no. And then we have really the core of our text today in verse 15. 
The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Do not call anything unclean that God has made clean. Do not call anything unholy that God has made holy. Don't do it. God's pulling rank. He's, he's pulling rank on Peter. He's using, the, he's using the God card. He's saying, I'm God. You're not. I decide what's holy and what's not. I decide what's clean and what's not. And I'm telling you that this, all these, all these animals right here, all this stuff, this stuff is clean. I know what I said, but it's clean. And if you really understood what I was talking about way back in Leviticus, you'd understand why it's clean and why it's okay. You know, Mark chapter 7, just kind of as a little bit of trivia. Mark chapter 7, Jesus actually kind of says the same thing. He actually says that the clean food, or the unclean food, by the way, it, it really doesn't matter. It's clean. You can eat it now. It's okay. Peter was with Jesus when Jesus said that, and he still doesn't get it. Sound familiar? It sounds kind of like us sometimes, right? We have to hear the same thing over and over and over again before it finally starts to sink in. So, Peter, so God says, what I have made clean, don't call it unclean. I have made this stuff holy. I have made this stuff acceptable. If you're really starting to get into this, you're going to be a little disappointed because I'm actually going to leave this hanging a little bit this week. You see, we're not going to cover the entire story of Peter and Cornelius this week. You're going to have to come back in two weeks to get to find out how it all wraps up and how it finishes. It's kind of my little teaser for the sermon in a couple weeks here. Okay, but... This story really doesn't resolve quite where we're at. You see, we have this advantage of having Luke and having, having Luke as the author kind of filling in these gaps and showing us the bigger picture. But to Peter, what Peter is looking at is he doesn't know about these men who are coming from Cornelius. He doesn't know about any what's about to happen or where this is all going. What he thinks is that this is all about food. I mean, really, I mean, Peter, it's all about food right now. He doesn't get it. But then the timing thing kicks in. In verse 17, while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who is known as Peter, was staying there. And while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. This vision, because it was all about food for Peter, he's confused and perplexed. He's still mowing it over, and he's so deep in thought, he doesn't even realize that somebody's shouting for him outside. And that's when the spirit kicks in and it says, don't, don't worry about it, Simon. There's three men looking for you. Go down and meet them. This is kind of like the Bible's way of saying, um, you know, I know this is going to sound bad, but... You know how people say that sometimes in conversation? I know this sounds bad, but, you know, we kind of do that. And it's kind of like apologizing for something ahead of time. This is sort of like the Bible doing exactly that, or the Spirit doing exactly that. saying, Peter, I know this is going to sound bad. I know you're not going to understand this, but there's three men downstairs who are dressed in Roman garb, and they're looking for you by name. You're going to want to fight them. You're going to want to resist and not go. It's okay. I sent them for you. Go. Don't fight. It's okay. Peter doesn't get this, but the timing is working out so perfectly here. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask for you to come ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. So Peter goes downstairs. He says, I'm Peter. I'm the one you're looking for. They explain why they're there. They go inside and they have dinner. Now, yes, in many ways, we have to leave this text kind of hanging because this is where we're ending it today. We have to leave the text kind of hanging until next time when the rest of the story is filled in and we get more of the meaning for why exactly these things are happening. But I don't want to leave you guys completely hanging. There's kind of a message here and a reality that when we look at a story like this, especially when we stop at where we are, we're faced with or we're reminded that so often things happen in our lives that we don't understand. We don't understand the timing. We don't understand why certain things happen to us when they do. We don't even understand, maybe even on a, on a more corporate level, maybe even why, why is Faith Christian Fellowship located here and where it is? 
Last week I said that, you know, oftentimes maybe we have to stop thinking about the fact that we are, that we sit here and we think so much and concentrate so much on the people that God brings into our lives. Maybe we need to turn that around and start thinking about why does God want me in that person's life? Maybe we need to expand that and think about that more corporately for a second, more on a congregational level. Fifty years ago, when we began, we bought property out in the middle of a walnut grove a mile or so outside of town. My guess is the reason that we bought this property is because it was cheap and because there was room to build a sanctuary and a parsonage there. Not to put it down, but my guess is that's probably a primary motivation right there. Fifty years later, we find ourselves not sitting in the middle of a walnut grove. We find ourselves sitting in the middle of town. And we're not just in the middle of town or not just in the middle of a city. We're surrounded by neighbors. We're surrounded by homes. We're surrounded by businesses. We have a main street right out here that is used by who knows how many cars on a daily basis. We're in a visible location. Fifty years ago when this property was built and these first buildings were put up, I'm going to guess nobody was thinking what this is going to be like in 50 years. We didn't necessarily have maybe even a really good reason or really much sense of what exactly God was going to do through us or through our location. And it may not even seem like much for what we have here, but we are, when it comes to ministry, this is, this is a prime spot that we have here, that we have our facility here. We're visible. People see us. It's easy to get to. Church planters, for what it's worth, they would kill to get a location like what we have right here. I mean, quite literally. This is a great location. And 50 years later, we're able to look at it and we're able to start thinking to ourselves, why does God want us here? Why did God open up this property when it did? Why did God give us the opportunity to purchase this property and to build and to hang on to it and put us right here? What was God's plan 50 years ago? for us today because it's not just a matter of God wanted us here 50 years ago God wants us in this exact spot today to minister to to serve to witness to transform the neighborhood that he has put us in we can't really come to any good resolution stopping in verse 23 today we are reminded though that there's so much of our future is unknown to us. So many things that happen now and the way they happen and the timing doesn't make sense. The story is still unfolding. What's the future going to bring for us? What's the Spirit going to do through us? Where is the Spirit going to lead us? What opportunities for ministry are going to open up? I don't know. None of us know. But we can be certain of is that we are here because God wants us here today. Only time will tell what that's going to bring. Let's pray.